Day two, module five, Apology of Physics. Begin at Newton's second law on page 146 and stop after doing on your own questions 5.3 and 5.4 on page 148. Newton needed more to explain motion than just the law of inertia. After all, that very law references the fact that an object's velocity can change if the object is acted on by an outside force. Newton's second law explains how this can happen. Newton's second law states that when an object is acted on by one or more outside forces, the vector sum of those forces is equal to the mass of the object times the resulting acceleration vector. In other words, if you push on an object, the amount that it accelerates depends on two things, the mass of the object and the magnitude of the force with which you push. In addition, the, set, the direction of the resulting acceleration will be the same as the direction of the force. Newton's second law is more often expressed with, the, with an equation rather than with words. Sigma F equals MA. So if you understand these symbols, you can see how the equation is equivalent to the definition given above. To begin with, this letter or this symbol right here is the capital Greek letter sigma. It means sum of. Thus, sigma F means the sum of the forces. The M in this equation represents the mass of the object and the A stands for the resulting acceleration. Since both F and A are um, vectors, we can more appropriately state this as the vector sum of the forces is equal to the mass times the acceleration vector which is identical to what the above definition says. All right, so this equation is probably one of the most fundamental equations in all of physics. So we will spend a lot of time on it. Let's start with the quantities in this equation. You should already be familiar with the concepts of mass and acceleration. However, you probably have little experience with the concept of force. So let's, let's go ahead and start there. What is force? Well, force is essentially a push or a pull exerted on an object in an effort to change that object's velocity. Equation 5.1 tells us that we can calculate force by multiplying mass and acceleration. Let's think about the units that result when we do this. Remember from the introductory remarks that the standard units we use in science were called SI units. The SI units for mass is kilograms. The SI units for acceleration is meters per second squared. When we multiply these two quantities together, we get a kilogram meter per second squared, which is often referred to as a Newton in honor of Sir Isaac Newton, which is fitting, since Newton is one of the most important figures in the history of physics. He deserves to have a unit that belongs in one of the most important equations in physics. So this is something you'll have to remember. The Newton is the SI unit of force and is defined as a kilogram meter per second squared. Now, of course, any unit that has a mass unit multiplied by a displacement unit divided by a time unit squared could also be considered a unit force. Thus, a gram kilogram per minute squared would also be a valid force unit. We just don't run into that that often. One force that you might run into occasionally is the dyne. It is used when you are dealing with smaller objects and forces and is equivalent to a gram centimeter per second squared. To give you an idea of how much force is associated with these units, if you were to hold a gallon of water in your hand, it would pull your hand down with the force of 40 newtons. On the other hand, when a fly lands on your finger, it pushes your finger down with a force of approximately 1,000 dynes. Thus, whereas one newton is a pretty significant force, one dyne is a very, very small force. The only thing left to learn about force is why it is a vector quantity. If you think about it, it should make sense. After all, if you push an object, the direction in which you, it will begin to accelerate depends on the direction in which you push it. If you push left, the object will accelerate to the left. If you push right, the object will accelerate to the right. Thus, if acceleration is a vector quantity, force must be as well. 
In fact, any acceleration that occurs as a result of a force must be in the same direction as the force. So now we know about force. It is a vector quantity whose magnitude is usually measured in newtons. When a force is applied to an object, that object will experience an acceleration in the same direction as the applied force. The magnitude of the acceleration depends on both the magnitude of the force and the mass of the object. Massive objects take a lot of force to achieve even a little acceleration. Objects that have a little mass need only a little force to achieve a large acceleration. Since we finally know what force is, we can go back to studying Newton's second law. As with many things in science, at first glance, Newton's second law seems simple. After all, this equation has only three variables, and none of them are squared, and the only mathematical function in the equation is multiplication. It doesn't get much easier than this, right? Well, not exactly. Although Newton's second law is simple in, in, in and of itself, the application of this law can get really complex. While you'll get a taste of the complexity in this model, you'll really see how complicated it can get in the next module. On your own 5.3, a man is pushing a car that has run out of gas. If he pushes with a force of 15 newtons west and the car has a mass of 1.23 times 10 to the 6 grams, what will the car's acceleration be? In this problem, we are given a force, 15 newtons west, and a mass, 1.23 times 10 to the 6 grams, and we're asked to calculate acceleration. Thus, this is a simple application of F equals MA. The problem, however, is that our units are not consistent. So right here, we have grams and kilograms. So we need to get our mass into the unit of kilograms, which I have done right here. So now, after we have the mass in kilograms, we're able to uh, use this equation, the sigma F equals M times A, to solve for A, we, devote, uh, we divide the force by the mass, substitute those numbers in, and you get 0 0.012 meters per second squared. A Newton force, which is pretty considerable, does not accelerate the car very quickly, only 0 0.012 meters per second squared. Since the acceleration has the same sign as the force, you know that they are both pointed in the same direction. On your own 5.4, a tennis ball bounces as shown in the diagram on the right. Here we go. It started here, it hit the ground here, and it's going this way. How can you tell that a force other than gravity must have acted on the tennis ball? The tennis ball changed direction, which means its velocity changed. Thus, it had to have experienced acceleration which means a force must have been acted on it. B, at what point did the force act on the ball? We can actually just see that it's right here. The force acted on the ball when its velocity changed, which is exactly when it hit the ground right here. C, what is the general direction, up, down, right, or left of that force? The velocity of the ball was heading down to the right. So it was starting here and it was coming down to the right. After the bounce, it was headed up and to the right. Thus, the force must have been directed up. So we can go ahead and circle up. What is the general direction, up, down, right, or left, of the acceleration resulting from that force? Okay, we should remember that force and acceleration point in the same direction. So the acceleration is also pointed 